Ready? Ready? Yep. Good afternoon and welcome to today's oversight hearing on the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. I'm Council Member Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education and a proud alum from Hunter College, class of January 1967. We are joined by the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, chaired by my esteemed colleague, Council Member I. Danique Miller of Queens. The Higher Education Committee serves as the Council's oversight committee regarding funding and other issues relating to the CUNY system, while the Civil Service and Labor Committee has jurisdiction over issues relating to collective bargaining, labor relations, and labor services for the City of New York. As such, our joint hearing on today's topic is important to the work of our respective committees. Witnesses invited to testify today include representatives from CUNY, the New York City Office of Labor Relations, and the New York State Department of Labor, as well as CUNY's Professional Staff Congress, students group, student groups, higher education and labor advocates, labor unions, academic institutions, and other interested parties. In addition to the new School of Labor and Urban Studies, we will hear two resolutions that are apropos to the topic of labor studies. Resolution number 190, introduced by Council Members Torres, Miller, Landa, Rivera, and Drum, would call upon the U.S. Supreme Court to protect labor sector collective bargaining in the case of Janus versus American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. And Resolution 240, introduced by Council Member Miller, would acknowledge the workers' gains through the American labor movement. Before I continue, I'd like to turn the floor over to Council Member Miller, Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, for his remarks concerning these resolutions. Good afternoon. Thank you, Council Member. Good afternoon. Thank you uh, once again for everyone for being here. My name is Council Member Idenik Miller, and I am the Chair of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor. I would like to thank my esteemed colleague from Brooklyn, Council Member Barron. <coughs> for her mutual interest in conducting today's joint hearing on the forthcoming CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. As stated, <clears throat> we will also hear two resolutions of concern to the, to the labor movement. First resolution, 190 of 2018, co-sponsored by Council Member Torres and myself, <clears throat> is of the utmost importance in, life of, in, in light of the Janus versus the AFME Supreme Court decision um, uh, hearing that was heard in uh, this past February. The outcome of this case could adversely affect unions across the nation, particularly here in our union dense city. A ruling in favor of the plaintiff Mark Janet would compromise the ability of unions to collect the agency fee and union dues from <clears throat> and dues, non dues from paying members to support the time and personnel costs entailed within collective bargaining and ensuring that employee, employers com compl are in compliance with such agreement. This could severely depress unions' membership across the country in creating a free ride program problem, which, we, which is why it is so important for us here in New York City to come together and show our support for unions and collective bargaining process that enables them to negotiate for fair wages, benefits, pensions, and working conditions for all of their members. Second resolution, we are introducing, uh, we are introducing in resolution uh, number 240, which acknowledges workers' gains through the American labor movement over the course of our country's history. As the sponsor of this resolution, I believe it is important to understand the profound legacy of the American labor movement. In light of Janice versus AFME, <coughs> me, we must look to our past to recognize how far we have come in terms of attaining better wages, benefit, pension, and working conditions for the American worker. I look forward to examining the progressions in establishing the new CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and hear from CUNY on the current status of its transition as is our understanding that the school will be fully operational for, up, for the upcoming 2019 academic year. We will also explore how the school will help to enhance the Murphy Institute existing programs and con contribute to the promoting educational opportunities for the New York City workers. The CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies will be on par with other CUNY schools oriented 
towards working professionals. The school would expand higher education opportunities for workers in ways that would be provided for, will, will be providing new career opportunities, secure employment, and promote upward mobility. It would also help the city meet its 21st century workforce needs. The Murphy Institute has served the needs of workers in the city of New York for over three decades and stands alone, and CUNY School will continue to serve that need while also providing new and exciting possibilities and opportunities. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the members of the committee that are here, and they, they just right on time. Uh, start with Council Member Mizell, and we have just been joined by Council Member Adams and Council Member King. Thank you so much, and with that, I return you back to my esteemed colleague from Brooklyn. Thank you, Council Member Miller. I wish to echo your sentiments as to the importance of the issues raised by resolutions 190 and 240. I would like also to acknowledge that we are holding this hearing today more than two years since our committee's last conducted a joint hearing and received testimony regarding the establishment of the Murphy Institute as a new CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. At that time, we recognized that the Murphy Institute was founded over 30 years ago, but continued to be housed within CUNY's School of Professional Studies, which is part of the Graduate School and University Center. And today, the Institute has yet to operate on its own school within CUNY's governance structure, despite having such an esteemed labor studies program and successfully educating many thousands of students and professionals during its 30 plus year run. The program has and continues to represent a great opportunity for many working class individuals that recognize the challenges they face and enables them to expand their education without stopping work. Indeed, to have a program focused on labor for those who labor allows CUNY, consistent with its mission, to reach a body of people previously marginalized from educational opportunities. While the testimony at our last hearing was largely favorable towards the Murphy Institute, it was disheartening to learn that a task force of three people established by CUNY to examine the elevation of the institute to a new school failed to see the merit in such an elevation. A lot has happened since then. Since then, CUNY's governing board of trustees finally saw the merit of elevating the institute to a new CUNY school, and in June 2017, it approved a resolution directing the chancellor to implement a transition plan subject to financial ability that would revise CUNY's governance documents and finally give the institute the status of a school that it has earned and indeed deserves. According to meeting minutes of the Board of Trustees, the transition process was to commence June 26, 2017, some 10 months ago. That was a significant step but requires many more to bring this plan to fruition. At today's hearing, the committees will examine what steps have been taken towards the transition process and when the new school will be ready to enroll students. We will also examine that financial resource, what financial resources have been provided by the state, city, or other sources, of fur, uh, other sources in furtherance of the transition and whether this support will enable the new school to hit the ground running once it is fully operational. I want to acknowledge my colleagues on the Higher Education Committee who are present, and we have Council Member Holden. I would also like to thank Joy Simmons, my Chief of Staff, Indigo Washington, my Director of Legislation, uh, Chloe Rivera, the, the Committee's Policy Analyst, Jessica Ackerman, the Committee's Senior Finance Analyst, and Paul Senegal, Counsel to the Committee. And at this time, we're gonna call the first panel and then we will uh, have the oath administered by the council. Okay, so we'll just do this first. And we're going to hear from Vice Chancellor Matthew Sapienza, Chief Financial Officer, and Vice Chancellor Vita Rabinowitz, University Provost. If you would raise your right hand, please. The council will administer the oath. Yes, in accordance with the rules of the council, I will administer the affirmation to the witnesses from the mayoral administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? 
Please state your names for the record. I am Peter Rabinovich, Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost of the City University of New York. Matthew Sapienza, Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer at CUNY. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Barron, Chair Miller, and members of the City Council Subcommittee on Higher Education and Civil Service and Labor. I am, as I stated, Peter Rabinowitz, Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost of CUNY, and I am pleased to come before you with my colleague, Senior Vice Chancellor. Sorry. Ah, yes, okay, okay. All right. You, you bet. Good afternoon, Chair Barron, Chair Miller, and members of the City Council Subcommittees on Higher Education and Civil Service and Labor. I am Vita Rabinowitz, Executive Vice Chancellor and University Provost of the City University of New York, and I'm pleased to come before you with my colleague, Matt Sapienza, Senior Vice Chancellor for Budget and Finance, to report on our progress on the transition of the Murphy Institute to the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Before addressing that, if I may, I want to take this opportunity to thank the Council, and particularly you, Chair Barron, for your critical, just-in-time support for CUNY's efforts to reform the developmental education programs. Thanks to the Council's generous investment over the past year, we have been able to deliver more test prep and expand pre-college efforts like CUNY START, and we are placing fewer students into remedial or developmental education. We're also developing new paths to college proficiency. These initiatives enable students to earn college credit sooner, save their financial aid for credit-bearing options, and uh, enable students to make better progress toward degrees. We have come far, but we have much farther to go but again, we thank the council uh, for enable us, enabling us to bring our innovations to scale. Now to the matter at hand, the transition of the Joseph S. Murphy Institute to the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. I am pleased to tell you that we have made great progress over the past year, and we, uh, we are on our way to um, realizing the dream of so many in this room to establish a great public labor school in the labor capital of our nation. Specifically, the new CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies seeks to accomplish the following. Provide undergraduate and graduate education in labor studies, including a specialization in labor relations. Provide undergraduate and graduate education in urban studies, including specializations in public policy and public relations. Increase higher education opportunities for workers, providing them with the knowledge and skills necessary for personal growth, career advancement, and economic mobility, while also addressing workforce needs of the city and state. And finally, to create new knowledge in labor and urban studies through basic and applied research and scholarship. We are fortunate, council members, in having the complete support of our board of trustees and the chancellery in this work, not to mention the strong support of national and local labor leaders and elected officials throughout the city and state. We are grateful for this support, and we appreciate that the hopes of many are riding on our efforts and depend on our success in this transition. Our goal is for the Murphy Institute to open its doors as the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies on August 29, 2018. So this year, from the start of our work, I have had key consultations with the following. I meet regularly with the Labor Advisory Board, consult regularly with the director, now founding dean, Dr. Greg Mancios, have had meetings with the chair of the Labor Advisory Board, the president of the Graduate Center, where the new school will be housed, and also the dean of the School of Professional Studies from, uh, from whence the new school came. I formed and chaired a visioning committee composed of faculty from labor and urban studies, both within and beyond CUNY. Labor leaders, 
a CUNY College president and central office personnel to help us position the new school in the global, national, and local domains of labor and urban studies to surface some of the questions, the issues, the challenges, and the opportunities that a new school will face. I met with the Murphy faculty, including central appointments, jointly appointed and consortial faculty to explore their aspirations for and their concerns about the new school. Shortly after this work, and frankly throughout this work, we come to organize uh, our progress as follows. We have established a committee and various subcommittees of Murphy faculty and staff to oversee the transition process. A team of central office staff, which includes an associate uh, provost for planning who reports directly to me and who is here with us today, um, assigned to help oversee and facilitate the transition. And there was a cross-campus working group of 18 members which meets weekly to develop and implement this transition plan. What have we accomplished? Well, with respect to new personnel appointments, we have appointed Dr. Gregory Mancios, longtime director of the Joseph S. Murphy Institute, as the founding dean of the new school, effective January 26, 2018. We have appointed two new faculty as distinguished lecturers. New and part-time, full-time and part-time staff have been added to the Murphy staff during the transition. These include a full-time information technologist and part-time specialist in human resources, the offices of the Bursar and budget and finance. With respect to key actions regarding accreditation and authorizations, the New York State Education Department has authorized CUNY to establish the new school as an urban campus of the Graduate Center of CUNY. The Higher Education Services Corps has agreed to issue new codes that will allow students in the new school to receive financial aid. Murphy faculty and staff are participating uh, in the Graduate Center's current review by the Middle States Commission on Higher Education, the accrediting body of our region and, um, and the body whose seven standards all units must meet in order to maintain accreditation. With respect to how the new school will be governed, a Murphy Institute faculty staff governance committee has been established and it's created a draft governance plan that was submitted to the central office. That document is currently under review with the aim of getting it finalized in time for submission to the CUNY Board of Trustees in June 2018. With respect to academic programs and policies. New articulation agreements that will facilitate the transfer of courses and credits between the Murphy School and other CUNY units are now being established with CUNY Community Colleges. Academic policies and a course catalog are being established for the new school. Regarding the Labor Advisory Board, to accommodate the change from an Institute of Labor Studies to the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, Murphy's Labor Advisory Board has been expanded to include representatives of community organizations and the board has been reconstituted as a labor and community advisory board. In the areas of branding, marketing, and communications, a website for the new school is under development and is expected to be launched sometime next month, May 2018. New logos have been designed and are under consideration. New promotional material is being designed. A student communication system is being developed as well as a media strategy. With regard to student services, the Murphy staff is collaborating with the University Office of Student Affairs to provide accessibility, veterans and career services to students who will be enrolled in the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. 
a contract with Baruch College is under negotiation that will provide the School of Labor and Urban Studies uh, students with a full range of library services through Baruch's library. Murphy's own special labor and industry collection will remain at 43rd Street and will be available to Baruch students with special services provided. Colleagues, the process of transitioning the Murphy Institute to the new School of Labor and Urban Studies involves a series of administrative and technical tasks, as you would imagine. The new school must find a way to perform complex administrative functions, such as finance, student records, and human resources. Because new schools like Murphy often start small but must still perform all the functions of a larger school, the new school must, must decide which functions and services it can provide effectively and efficiently, mm -hmm. and which should be provided in partnership as a shared service uh, with another office within CUNY, either at the Graduate Center or the Central Office. This shared services model allows the new school to provide its students with high quality services while the school grows in size and expertise. As of this time, the new School of Labor and Urban Studies has agreements with the CUNY Central Office for the following shared services. Registrar, budget, procurement, and accounts payable, and human resources. Each of these areas has a part-time staff person to coordinate between the central office and the new school. The new school is currently reviewing options for the bursar function because the number of students is still small, financial aid services will remain with the Graduate Center for the time being. With regard to recruitment and admissions, the new school will manage these functions starting in the spring 2019 semester. Technical tasks are a major part of the transition. Uh, as many of you know, CUNY uses an integrated information system to manage all business administrative and enrollment management function. An IT team has been assigned to do the technical work that will transition the, uh, the Murphy Institute into the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. The data processing systems, CUNY First, DegreeWorks, Hobson's, that are essential to managing the administration of a self-standing school will be operational by the end of August. The IT team has finished the requirements gathering process and is now building the workflow tables. We expect IT to be fully op operational by August. New and continuing students have all been informed of this transition and, um, uh, and, uh, they will, and new and incoming students will be able to register for the new school for the upcoming fall semester. So council members, that concludes the technical portion of my testimony, but I am immensely proud what our faculty, staff, elected officials, labor leaders, and the central office have been able to accomplish, particularly in the past year in creating the new school. Set to open again with the name CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies in fall 2018. Despite our progress, many challenges remain including fundamental ones in areas ranging from setting priorities to achieve, achieving uh, goals, to getting the school on a firm financial footing by growing enrollments and securing under other funding streams. But we are convinced that the new school will deliver on its promise to make outstanding contributions to knowledge and thought. Just last month, CUNY Distinguished Professor Joshua Freeman, jointly appointed by Murphy and Queens College published Behemoth, a history of the, faculty, of the factory and the making of the modern world to rave reviews in the New York Times and other national publications. In fact, the Times calls this book required reading for all Americans because this unique contribution to the history of factories helps explain the significance of manufacturing in our national imagination and identity and how that resonates to this day in our discourse, policy and politics. We know that this book is the kind of scholarship, the kind of, the kind of work that we will continue to produce and in greater numbers with, with a larger faculty. 
much work remains to be done in the remainder of the semester. We will do that work. Uh, I want to add in closing that as crucial as this new entity is to CUNY's commitment to workers and working class communities in New York and around the nation, this is by no means our only major initiative to serve adults and the working people of New York. CUNY, as you know, provides an array of workforce development programs and programs designed to meet the needs of working people. We are determined to do more and better. Better serving working adults is a major component of our strategic framework, Connected CUNY, and it is the uh, centerpiece of our new adult learner initiative, which seeks to improve access policies, services, and to increase academic programs, format options, career ladders, and degree completion. Our aim is to reach the 800,000 New Yorkers with some college and no degree, and the 1.4 million with high school diplomas, but no post-secondary education. I hope the council will continue to support our work. You have helped bring us to this point. We are immensely grateful for what you have done. Uh, we hope you continue to support our work to improve remedia remedial education, to support CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, and I hope someday I get to report to you on our exciting new work on the Adult Learner Initiative. Thank you for your time, council members. Good afternoon, Chairpersons Barron and Miller and members of the Higher Education and Civil Service and Labor Committees. I am Matt Sapienza, CUNY's Senior Vice Chancellor and Chief Financial Officer. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you about the new CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Executive Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz has described the planning, implementation, and vision of the new school, but I will spend a few minutes today discussing the current finances and budgetary needs going forward. For fiscal year 2019, beginning July 1st, the School of Labor and Urban Studies tax levy operating budget will be derived from three main sources, the state, the city, and tuition revenue. From the state's budget, we are very pleased that the governor allocated an additional $1.5 million in his executive proposal for the new school. This supplemental funding was included in the recently enacted state budget for fiscal year 2019. When combined with a legislative allocation of $1.5 million and with a longstanding $500,000 base budget for the Joseph F. Murphy Institute, the total direct appropriation from New York State for the new school will be $3.5 million. The university has historically allocated $1.6 million of its state operating funds to the Murphy Institute, and those dollars will continue to support the School of Labor and Urban Studies. In addition to these direct appropriations, we are projecting another $3.9 million in state-based expenditures for the School of Labor and Urban Studies in fiscal year 2019, 2 million of which is for fringe benefit expenses and 1.9 million to cover rental costs for the school's leased facility. In total, approximately $9.2 million in state funds will be allocated to the new school for fiscal year 2019. With regards to tuition revenue, we project that the School of Labor and Urban Studies will generate approximately $1.5 million. In future years, as the school expands and serves a growing number of students, total revenue will increase and therefore be available to help support this expansion. The third funding source, city funds, is something that we are specifically seeking your help with as part of this year's budget cycle. We are deeply appreciative of the $940,000 city council allocation for the Murphy Institute in fiscal year 2018, and are especially grateful to the Higher Education and Civil Service and, Civil Service and Labor Committees for helping se to secure this funding. This allocation, however, is not baselined in the city's out-year financial plan, and therefore we are requesting that these funds be restored as part of the fiscal 2019 adopted budget process. The university's fiscal 19 Budget request, which was approved by a Board of Trustees in October 2017, included a total funding need of $4.1 million for the School of Labor and Urban Studies. With the additional $1.5 million provided by the governor, this leaves a remaining need of $2.6 million. 
we will continue to work with both the state and the city to maximize future funding so that the vision described by Executive Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz can be implemented effectively in the coming years. Chairpersons Barron and Miller and members of each committee, please be assured that the university deeply appreciates your continued commitment to a high quality CUNY education, which is the vehicle that so many New Yorkers rely on for the path of upward mobility. I uh, thank the panel for their presentation. And I do want to acknowledge that we've been joined by several other council members, council member Rodriguez, council member Kalos, council member Danny Drum, council member Lori Cumbo, and council member Andy King was here as well. So we want to acknowledge all of them. I wanna thank you for your testimony and uh, we're gonna start with the questions. Um, in terms of the transitioning you indicated that you had been working with several groups. Yes. Uh, you talked about a labor advisory board, a visioning committee, Murphy mm -hmm. faculty, mm -hmm. uh, central office staff, and a working group. And it says that the working group meets weekly, yes. but I wanted to know how frequently these other groups meet. And when did they start meeting and what's the regularity of the meeting? Right. Uh, thank you, Chair Barron. I will try to answer that to the best of my ability because they're all on different cycles. Um, the Labor Advisory Board meets at least once a semester, and it may meet more often than that. So when, when that uh, body meets, I meet with it. So I, you know, I, I, am, uh, I am invited uh, as a member and indeed um, my schedule is often accommodated in setting up that meeting, but it, it, it meets, um, you know, about two, three times a year. How many meetings has it had uh, since June of 2007, or whenever, since its inception? Okay, I, I Regarding have, Murphy. We, it's a, it's a good question. I have been in my position for a little over two and a half years, in fact, close to three, and I believe I've been invited to the, um, to the meetings from the time I started, and I'm sure the meetings predate me. Um, the desire for Murphy to, be, to become a school has existed for a long time, as you, you know very well, Chair Barron. In fact, the day I started at CUNY, a draft task force report to which you referred in your own opening comments was on my, was on my desk. So uh, I've been regular. I've been meeting with that group for two and a, for two and a half years. The other uh, groups were shorter lived. Um, the weekly meetings started just a few months ago. Uh, the, the the meetings of the working group. I mm -hmm. I me I've met with the faculty when they asked me to meet. I last met with them December twenty first of two thousand seventeen. Uh, the visioning committee met twice and we had extensive emailing and those meetings were in fall 2017. And there's another group. Central office staff. Central office staff. Um, I meet with, uh, th this group changes depending on the issues, but the central office staff group, I believe meets weekly. Uh, it's been joined by new members, but it's a reg it is now a regularly meeting uh, a group. We, you talked about uh, appointing the dean. Have you completed that? Is it finalized? And if so, can you tell me about the search process that you used and uh, the announcement that was put out for that? Because you know that's something that I'm quite interested to know, that process. Of course. That's used. Of course. Um, as I mentioned, Dr. Mancios, who has been the director and leader of the Murphy Institute for decades, since the 80s, probably of well over 30 years, uh, was named founding dean with there was no search process, Chair Barron. It is an interim position. Uh, that is, we, we, we went immediately to appoint, appointment to honor the extraordinary service of Dr. Mancios as leader and to help accelerate the move to making a school 
at CUNY, all permanent positions are the result of a search. The, the searches are almost always national searches. They have search committees that are approved at different levels. And that did not take place for the appointment of the founding and acting dean. Uh, and CUNY has precedent for that kind of appointment. Dr. Ken Olden was the interim and founding dean of the CUNY School of uh, Public Health, for example, just a few years ago. There will, at some point, be a search for the dean. And this has been an issue you know, of, of discussion with uh, Dean M Mancios. Uh, CUNY rules state the following, that um, interim or acting appointments are on an annual basis. Uh, they may be renewed once. And as long as a search starts, a valid search starts in that second year, um, we would be within the CUNY guidelines. So we need to start a search within the two-year appointment, which began January 26, 2018. Okay. And I saw that you, uh, in your testimony, that you had hired two additional new faculty. I think you said two. That's correct. So how was that uh, process conducted, and what were the positions or the departments, and what prompted that? Okay. Um, two distinguished lecturers were hired by the school. This was not um, by the central office. This was by the school. Um, and it, in at least one case, I, I'm not sure how um, uh, I'm not sure how one of the faculty was hired. Uh, but in one case, I know because of in part because of of an urgent matter, we requested and received a search waiver at the request of, uh, of uh, Dr. Mancios. Then that was for a distinguished lecturer. Distinguished lecturer, to be clear, is a full-time position, but it is not a, um, a tenure-track position. And, and uh, these are annual appointments of, of um, distinguished uh, uh, scholars or practitioners uh, who can be appointed annually for up to seven years. Also in your testimony, you mentioned uh, the certification process. Yes. Where are we in that? How will it be, how do we expect that it will be concluded? And what is the timeline that we're facing? Right, right. Fortunately, we do not need separate, uh, we, have, we have concluded our process with the state of New York. Um, the Murphy, uh, the state of New York has intense interest in new degree granting program development, but the creation of a school is within CUNY's power. So we are, you know, uh, we, 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 we are well on our way there. Um, the new school. So there's no outside entity that has to be involved in that's this. That's right. Okay. That's right. We 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 are we are set to go there. The new school will be accredited as part of the graduate center process, and uh, in fact, that's ongoing right now. But there is no formal process standing in the way of Murphy becoming a school. Thank you. I have lots of other questions, but I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Councilman Rivera. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'd like to talk a little bit about a lot. About it. First of all, I want to say to everyone that's in this room and, and my colleagues here how proud I am and of the efforts that was made of uh, just about everybody in this room to, to see this, this vision come to fruition and uh, the fact that, 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 it, that, uh, that uh, its director, Greg uh, Mansell, will, will continue to lead the way there that we feel that it is in certainly in good hands, but this is certainly a moment when people work collaboratively together over an idea and a vision that, it, you know, no matter how long it takes that we can get there. With that being said, with some of those, some of these um, groups and individuals that were a part of this, and, you, and uh, Council Member talked about uh, some of the individuals that w w would be a part of the, um, the transition she spoke about meeting, but what exact input was, was given uh, from, from, from 
uh, Kermit Murphy faculty and uh, the team that's over there now, mm -hmm. um, exactly what kind of input uh, was provided and, and how could you speak to that? It's a, it's a great question, Chair Miller. Um, the, we sought input for, Murphy is a small unit, but it is very rich. It, it represents labor studies, urban studies, worker education and workforce development, and it produces original scholarship in labor and urban studies. A, a small unit of four central line tenure track faculty with a few distinguished lecturers, some jointly appointed faculty, some consortial faculty, do all of, you know, do work in those four strands. So we needed to consult with labor leaders because we want to be responsive to and we want to be uh, uh, useful to labor leaders. We needed to focus, we needed to consult with scholars in both urban studies and labor studies. What is the future of labor? What is the future of work? We, so we, we needed to speak with faculty and we spoke with faculty both within CUNY and um, be, beyond CUNY. Um, so a Harvard professor and an NYU professor were invited to be part of our group. We have spoken with people who care about the school, the, the, the wonderful head of our Labor Advisory Board, Arthur Chelyotis. We've spoken with Henry Garrido, with Sandy Vito, with you know several. So we've, with other CUNY presidents. So I'm sorry, Chair Miller, just to say it's been a very complicated process. No, I, I see that you've really done your due diligence and I, I think that members of, of the council here may have been the only ones that weren't uh, engaged in, in, in the process. And, uh, but that is, it is refreshing to hear that so many people had input. Um, in what ways do you think that that the body of all this work that you put into the, uh, that everyone in, in, that has been involved in the transition has put into it that will improve upon what Murphy has done already by by uh, these collaborations and, and coming to becoming the School of Labor and Urban Studies. What do we foresee right. uh, that we, we have not seen as of yet? Well, um, I think it's a very bright future. It's a galvanizing idea and w galvanizing beyond those that Murphy currently touches. I mean, we're proud of this in CUNY and this will attract, you know, um, uh, new initiatives, new, new, new people, new, new ideas. Uh, the, the, frankly, the consultations also surfaced some issues that will be challenges. For example, with you know, uh, labor studies, urban studies, workforce development, what do we prioritize? Where do we hire first? Where do we make our initial investments? Quite frankly, it's not entirely obvious. So that was one of the things that, um, that has, you know, has surfaced. Again, th this is in a way a good problem to have, but frankly, it is a challenge. Have, have we worked out the logistics of the additional space that will be needed? Because uh, I know even beyond this, we're certainly expecting uh, to grow um, the, the student enrollment. Correct. But beyond that, I know that there was, uh, th there was uh, some searches for additional space. Um, how has CUNY been able to assist there? Mm -hmm. I'm going to turn to, yes, yes. Thank you. Senior Vice Chair. Chair Miller, we, we recognize that as part of the planned expansion of the, of the school that um, space needs will be something that um, we're going to need to address. We do have a new needs request that has been submitted to OMB for additional lease space um, for, the, for the school. Um, and so we're hopeful of, of that um, bearing some, some fruit in, as part of the executive budget. Um, our, our immediate focus is on getting the school open and up and running for, for late August, as, as <laughs> Executive Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz said earlier, but, um, but we know that space is something that we're going to need to address, and we are looking at what opportunities could be out there and how we can, um, how we can find additional space for the school uh, and their planned expansion in the out years. Do you find that the, I think you mentioned 9.2 total uh, 
uh, budget is going to be sufficient for uh, fiscal year uh, 2019. Uh, what, what do you expect that the ask will be uh, as we move forward? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good question, um, and I think that um, we are we will need to, and we are seeking additional funding for the next year coming up for fiscal nineteen. Um, again, as I said earlier, we're very grateful that the governor um, included one point five million dollars in his executive budget for the School of Labor and Urban Studies as part of the state's um, enacted budget process. We were talking to folks in the Assembly and the Senate about restoring their legislative add of $1.5 million that we needed that to be restored, which they did and, and, this, and we're very grateful for. But as part of those discussions, we were seeking an additional $800,000 um, for the School of Labor and Urban Studies. So it would have been a new $2.3 million for next mm -hmm. year. Um, and so at this point, um, we still are seeking that $800,000. Plus, we need, as I said earlier, the $940,000 that the council um, so graciously gave to the Murphy Institute this year. We're counting on that being restored as part of the city's adopted budget process too. So those are the two pieces that um, we would seek for next year's operating budget. And again, as I mentioned earlier, we do have a, a new needs request on space that's been submitted to OMB. Okay, um, we've been joined by council member Ulrich. Er uh, and um, I do have some other questions that I'm gonna pass along to my colleagues here. Councilmember Drum. I didn't hear, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, did you say how you're gonna make up that extra 800,000? Um, well, if the funds don't come through, I think we have to look at um, some of the plans we had for next year and, and see how we can um, you know, live within a, a, a lower than what we'd hoped for budget. Um, so whether that's internally at the university and or you know, working directly with the school, um, some of the planned expansion, we may have to slow down if that 800,000 doesn't come through. And you are requesting the uh, 940,000 from the council? Correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I have a few other questions and then if there are other members, we can turn it over to them as well. So continuing on this line, Part of your testimony uh, says that we're lo you're looking for funding from three streams, mm -hmm. uh, state, city, and then there's that dreaded T word, yes. <laughs> tuition. And you say 1.5 million from tuition. Can, can you speak to us about the tuition at the Murphy School, how that will be uh, calculated? Are we sure. talking about that? Sure. Um, so we're projecting about $1.5 million for next year from both undergraduate and, and graduate students. Um, the students there pay the same rates of other senior college students throughout the system in whatever degree program that they're in. Um, and as I mentioned in my testimony, we do have planned um, expansion in terms of enrollment growth for the, mm -hmm. for the school. Um, and so as we take in more students, that will generate additional tuition revenue, which we'll be able to use to not only support those additional students, but to help pay for some of the, the costs of the school being independent. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, um, that's part of our financing strategy is to have that additional revenue be used to invest 100% back in the school. Can you talk to us about the scholarship that presently exists at uh, the Murphy, at what's now the Murphy Institute, and how, how much is in that fund, how decisions are made as to who can apply for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, oh, Nick, would you like to? Okay. Okay, yes. Chair Barron, I will, I will begin to answer that question. As far as I'm aware, there are two, um, important scholarships in the Murphy School. One of them, them is the Diversity in Labor Scholarship, uh, and the other is a Tuition Assistance Scholarship, which is paid for by tax levy funds. The one I think you referenced is the Diversity in Labor Scholarship. And 
That was initiated by a challenge grant from our former Chancellor Matthew Goldstein, uh, where CUNY uh, ceded the school $100,000 a year. Um, I don't know all of the requirements, but I know that the scholarship is meant for, um, uh, the purpose of the scholarship is to diversify the labor leadership and labor scholarship. Um, and so underrepresented groups in labor um, are welcome to receive the scholarship. I believe both graduate and undergraduate students in with specializations in labor are eligible. And the grant, because it's a challenge grant, it attracts other funds. Chancellor Goldstein's promise was five years, $100,000 a year. That, um, that money ran out a year ago. We extended the scholarship for this year while we transition the school. And, uh, you know, I am uh, hoping that when the new chancellor comes, as you know, we're in a transition period, we have a search for a new chancellor, that uh, while, while we are not in a position to make a commitment in the future of that kind, this is the kind of thing we'll be talking to the new chancellor about. So the, uh, the awards that were given in the past, what was the average size, how many students were able to uh, benefit from that, and how do you define diversity? Right, I, I, I fear I don't have that information, um, uh, Chair Barron. That is something we can certainly get for you. I know that the graduate uh, scholarships are larger than the undergraduate scholarships, appropriately, and it depends to some degree on how many credit students take and things like that. But we can get you. The, the information on the diversity and labor scholarships. How does the Murphy Institute measure its success? That's a great question. And I'm probably not the best person to answer it, but I think I know. I mean, I think I know some of the things that the Murphy Institute wants to do. Well, from, from your standpoint, how do you right. look at, right. the, at right. this institute right. and say, oh, wow, they did a great job. What are, okay. what are the indicators? S several things. I think um, a great labor school in a great city, and again, the labor capital of the United States, would produce labor scholars and labor leaders, educate, educate that, that, that group of people and propel them to great futures. It would also champion research that's relevant to um, the economic mobility of working class communities, much like what CUNY does. So the, I, I see the school is producing great scholarship, great scholars, and great leaders, great practical leaders in movements and in, in advocacy for working people. Um, I, I also think that a sign of success of, of the school is that it diversifies labor leadership and advocacy and community organizing. I think the school should be a thought leader. I want the school to be a thought leader in CUNY. Um, CUNY is an engine of economic mobility. I think this school could be a leader within that movement. Beyond that, Chair Barron, the school seeks to excel in certain areas, healthcare policy, public administration and public policy, community leadership, and as it grows, its areas of specialization would grow. But I would think the school would, would be a success if enrollments grow, if graduates grow, and if lots of leaders around this country could claim this school. Council, Ad Council Member Adams has questions and we'll hear from her now. Thank you, Chair Barron. Thank you so much for being here today, Provost Rabinowitz and uh, Chancellor Sapienza. Thank you so much. My questions um, are going to piggyback uh, Chair Barron in the sense of speaking of diversity. Mm -hmm. um, and again, we thank you for championing uh, the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. Does the eligibility for the diversity in labor um, scholarship include identifying as a woman or a person of color as far as diversity is concerned? Yes, Councilwoman Adams, as far as I know, again, the, the, the purpose here is not simply to award scholarships for people who are committed to diversity, 
but for people who are themselves diverse members of the, the labor community. So yes, uh, that's exactly what the scholarship aims to do. Thank you. So in addition to the diversity in labor scholarship, how does the Murphy Institute indeed foster diversity? One way is my understanding, and again, I could be off a little bit, is 80% of Murphy students are people from underserved groups. 80% of all students are students of color. Um, a smaller percentage, I think it's closer to 60%, are women. And because women uh, may be underrepresented in, in, in some la labor movements, this is important as well. The diversity scholarship, the fact that one of the major scholarships, in fact the most visible, is for diversity, I think speaks volumes. And every, the school, I, I will also say, of the core, of the Murphy hired faculty, um, two of that, two of the four professorial rank faculty are uh, black men, and the two new distinguished professors are also black men. So, so two of the six Murphy faculty, um, uh, four of the six Murphy faculty are people of color. Um, the other two are white women. Um, this is extraordinary uh, commitment to diversity, and, um, and I, but I want to say that the university is committed uh, to diversifying its faculty throughout but Mur Murphy exemplifies this commitment. I, I thank you for that. I, I can only say that if we had a model like this across the board, um, it would be something to behold. So, yes. so we thank you for that indeed. Um, to follow up with that, and this will be my final question, in addition to the Diversity and Labor Scholarship, are there any other scholarships available? And if so, what are they and the criteria? The only other one that I know of that is specific to Murphy is the is the um, the masters uh, for master students and it's tuition assistance scholarship tax levy paid administered by the Murphy um, Institute itself, but Councilwoman, I don't know. I don't know the eligibility requirements of that of that scholarship. I will say the dean is present. If if that is something you want to know now, we, I, you know, with with your permission, we could learn that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, I would like to have that answered at some point. Okay, we'll ask the dean to come forward, and he'll be sworn in, and uh, we'll get an answer. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Do you affirm to tell the truth? Uh, would you raise your right hand, yes. please? Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee? And to I respond do. honestly to council members' questions? I do. Please state your name for the record. Gregory Mancius. So the um, uh, Provost Rabinowitz is correct about the diversity uh, scholarship program. I just want to add that uh, the answer to the question about how much the allocations are, those are grants of 20 or $30,000, depending upon whether it's undergraduate or graduate study. So at the graduate level, it's a $30,000 award. And that is, uh, uh, those are granted typically to six students each year. As far as the uh, um, graduate uh, tuition scholarship, uh, that is based on both merit and need, mm -hmm. and there is a uh, committee uh, composed of mostly faculty and some staff members who review the applications on a uh, uh, annual basis and make uh, make awards. Thank you, Dean. That mm -hmm. you, you you answered the second part of my question. That was who determines it. You answered yeah. beautifully for me uh, with the committee information. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, panel. So I have a question then. You mentioned the faculty. What is the total number of faculty members that you have at Murphy? Sure. Um, so we have, um, let me 
Let's see. It, it's, it's a little bit complicated because we have four full-time uh, faculty members uh, pro, at, at the professorial uh, rank. We have um, uh, two jointly appointed faculty members, um, uh, Professor Milkman, who's jointly appointed with the graduate school, and Professor Freeman, who's jointly appointed with, the, uh, with Queens College. We also have six um, uh, consortial faculty. These are faculty who have uh, appointments primarily at other institutions and then are, um, uh, join our faculty for the purposes of governments um, and uh, have full rights and privileges uh, as do the other faculty members in terms of um, governance of the institute or soon to be school. So in total, what would you give us as the number of faculty that you have? Uh, 13. And are they assigned to specific departments, either the labor or the urban studies? Yes, they are. And so how does that break So down? they're either, uh, there are uh, five faculty members uh, in uh, urban studies and seven in labor studies. And as we transition to the school, will there be an equal emphasis in expanding mm -hmm. each of the departments or will you weigh one, one more heavily than the other? No, um, there'll be an equal emphasis because at the at present time, uh, the number of students enrolled in both programs is pretty much equivalent uh, with a little variation, but not much. And we hope to grow both programs equally. In terms of your present student population, will they seamlessly uh, move into the school? Will there be any kinds of adjustments that will be made or any kind of requirements for them to do something differently? We spend just about every working hour the last two months and we'll continue to do that for the next few months to make sure that it's as seamless as possible. Uh, our emphasis right now is to make that transition uh, so that the student experience in September is not affected in, in any way. And I think we'll come very, very close to it. And which means, by the way, that we're moving at lightning speed administratively to, uh, to ensure that transition. So what will be the difference between mm -hmm. the Murphy Institute as it presently exists mm -hmm. and the Murphy School of Labor and Urban mm -hmm. Studies? What would be the difference? How will we know we now have a school? Well, I think first and, and foremost, uh, our students will be earning a degree from something called a CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, and, and that's a really big deal. Um, this is a recognition that these are fields of study that have prominence uh, within the university and within the academy more generally. Uh, and I think our students see that more than anything else as um, a, a, a great advance. It's, uh, um, it's not a field that is buried uh, within a, a university structure. It is something that is recognized like other fields, schools of journalism, schools of law, business. Um, this is, this is going to be a, a very Quality, a, a significant qualitative difference in the awarding of degrees. Um, secondly, uh, I think uh, this gives the school, the, the, the recognition of Murphy as a school gives us um, a greater ability to develop educational policies and practices better suited for our students and for the constituents that we serve. Um, so we will be in a position to open our doors for the first time uh, to first-time students. Um, that may not happen overnight, but, uh, but we're looking forward to developing uh, a strong undergraduate program for first-time students. We uh, are coming to you and have, come to the, and have gone to the legislature to ask for additional funds specifically to add uh, uh, 
staff, academic support staff, to ensure that we can properly serve first-time students, adult students who've never been to college before. Um, uh, secondly, um, uh, we will be able to uh, develop new academic programs. We are anxious to develop a new uh, bachelor's degree program in labor study, something that we have not had. We've only had it on the graduate level, and we've had a, a bachelor's degree in, lab in community and urban studies with a minor in labor studies, and we'll now be able to develop our own bachelor's degree in, in urban studies, in labor studies, rather. Um, I think the resources that we uh, have been allocated by the state and by the city council uh, will allow us to grow. Uh, we'll need the space to do that, but it, uh, you know, it looks like that's coming as well. Uh, but we envision the program growing um, twofold in the next five years. And um, so I think uh, we will have the resources to better serve our students. I think we'll have the, be uh, the resources to better serve our community. I just want to mention that the, there's a there's another pillar to the school, and that is service to the community. And we're very proud of the fact that we have become a hub of intellectual and activist uh, activity. And we uh, plan to add more public programming to what we do. We plan to do more applied research to expand our educational, the, the development of educational material. All that is part of the plan as well. Just one final question before I turn it back to my colleague. In terms of the shared services, uh, in the testimony it said that students will have access to the library services at Baruch. Correct. Isn't that a feature of CUNY that you can go to any of the libraries in any of the CUNY system? Are students at one university? Uh-oh, there's a pause. No, no, it, it, you are, uh, we do have uh, reciprocal arrangements, Chair Barron, but it's also the case that I believe students, and, and here I, I'm going to return to my colleague, um, uh, students may have special privileges at the library of their college. For example, um, the ability to take out laptop computers or other kinds of um, enhanced privileges. So while it is true that students can gain access, students from one CUNY college can gain access to the libraries of other CUNY colleges, the ability to check books out. So will, will Murphy School students have those enhanced abilities yes. at Baruch? That's the okay. idea. Am I not correct? That's correct. Good. Okay, yes, okay. okay, so that, that's it. Okay, and uh, Councilmember Miller. Thank you, Councilman. Um, so be, before I just I, very briefly, um, I want to follow up on uh, Councilman Members Adams' question about the scholarship programs. Uh, currently, the students that are uh, enrolled in the School of Professional Services currently um, who receive scholarships will will will, will they be allowed to uh, continue with dual receiving dual scholarships, one for Murphy and professional services. Okay. Um, Chair Miller, so uh, if a student is a School of Professional Studies student not affiliated with Murphy, my understanding is, and I'll check this, that once the, once the, uh, the Murphy School transitions to the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies, my understanding is that, that, that students would not be uh, eligible for SPS scholarships. However, what I can answer is for students who currently have those scholarships, I, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I, I don't want to prejudge those situations, but it, you know, uh, and uh, I'm sure it depends on terms and conditions, but ordinarily a student, you know, a Hunter scholarship is only for a Hunter student. An SPS scholarship is only for an SPS student. But I can imagine there might be complicating circumstances. So, I mean, with those, obviously those who are currently enrolled, we're talking about seamless transitions, whether or not they, they would be grandfathered in. What, what are the possibilities okay. of doing that? Certainly that's something right. that we, we should be exploring. Yeah. Okay. There, it, particularly I, if they're gonna incur additional yeah. expenses. Yeah. I agree that we should look into the, that matter. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, 
uh, I, I think the grants have been already made, but uh, the provost was correct that we will, uh, those, those relationships will end in terms of the scholarships available through SPS. But I, I do have to add that we're doing quite well with scholarship opportunities yes, within Murphy, and we received a, uh, an anonymous grant of $50,000 to establish an emergency fund for our students. We made our first award um, actually yesterday. Uh, and so we're glad because that was something we were going to miss from SPS. Right. They do have an emergency fund, but we do now have one as well. Okay, and, and uh, will, will, will the, the school be providing online opportunities as well? Uh, they Considering will, the demographics? Yes, they will, um, and we are encouraging uh, our students to enroll in uh, SPS online courses through an e-permit sim system. And so they will be meeting some of their gen ed requirements yes. until we get a full array of course offerings at the undergraduate level. They will be taking courses at SPS online. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Councilmember Holden, you have questions? Yes, uh, thank you for your testimony, everyone. Um, how, many, um, how many advisory board members are currently in place? There are 22 uh, organizations represented. Most of them are, uh, all of them, um, the, it's the principal who's on the board, and many of them also have appointed designees as well but 22 organizations. Because I would think that would be a, a resource for um, scholarships also I mean, in the advisory board. Um, the articulation agreement, can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, how many um, schools, how many community colleges are already on board? If any? Right. I'm not right. sure I understand. The articulation agreement between the community colleges to transfer into the um, Murphy right. School? So. Um, uh, we are establishing um, a, a, what we're calling an urban academy in collaboration with community colleges. And um, we don't have any uh, articulation agreements in place yet, but we are uh, well along the way with two uh, community colleges, BMCC uh, and Kingsboro. Yeah, because that would be, uh, obviously, to it's increase enrollment, mm -hmm. you would need that in place. Right. Um, so I think you're kind of behind at this mm -hmm. point mm -hmm. if you're going to open in, uh, on August mm -hmm. 20, 29th, mm -hmm. is it? Is it? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Well, we, we should point out that we do have 400 students currently enrolled in the Murphy Institute at SPS, so those students will come with us. Uh, but in terms of expanding... Uh, in theory, the in theory they'll come with right. you because there's also a challenge of travel. Um, no, because no, they've always been taking it. Okay. They, they'll be taking the classes in the exact same location. Okay. So we, we suspect we won't lose any students if. And, and speaking of losing, you said there's about 15 full-time faculty. Is, was that full-time? No. Okay. No. Uh, the six of those faculty are consortial faculty. So typically they will teach one course with us, and the rest of their teaching load will be with their home institution. So nine full-time. No. Uh, then there are two. Uh, okay. Joy. Right. Yeah, that's why I said it. it's, it's complicated. But oh, it's complicated, but you'll, you'll have to yes. hire new yes. faculty then. And, yes. And the budget that the um, estate uh, allocated in this upcoming fiscal year will provide us with uh, uh, three to four new faculty positions. So uh, the total allocation from the state will provide us with seven new faculty lines. Half of that money was awarded this year, so we anticipate moving Seven forward. Seven new full-time faculty lines as opposed to adjunct. Correct. Right. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I guess that's it. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing that there are no further questions. Oh, you do? I'm sorry, Councilmember Miller. And I do want to acknowledge that we have been joined also by Councilmember Williams. <laughs> okay, um, with, uh, in regards to student uh, participation in, in the process that was going on there, could you explain what the, the student government's role was in this transition and what role they will play as we move forward? Mm -hmm. if so, any? Yeah, great question. So um, we uh, 
undertook a strategic planning uh, process um, actually two years ago when we first uh, began to envision the school and thought that this might actually happen and we brought in um, uh, students, faculty, members of the community, uh, uh, staff. Uh, it was a broad uh, range of constituents that were involved in developing a mission statement, developing a set core of values, uh, and a plan for realizing a number of very important strategic goals. Uh, students were very much integrated in that process. Um, we are going to be creating our own uh, separate uh, student government. We have not done that yet, but it will begin, uh, we will begin that process in the fall. They will be a part of, of, of uh, faculty and administrative governance as well? Decision making, the, the they will have a voice there? Yeah, the governance plan that uh, the provost made reference to that was submitted actually yesterday uh, for review by the central office does include student representatives in the governing council of the school. Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, we want to thank the panel for your presentation. And if we should have further questions, we will submit them to you and expect that you'll be able to get back to us in written form. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Council Members. Thank you. All right. This is good thing. Good news. Yes, it is. It is. Thank you. Our next panelist, I believe, is going to be Arthur Chiliotos. And as he's preparing to come forward, we invite him to come. I'm going to ask the council to swear you in. Okay, just give us your name and your testimony. Uh, my name is Arthur Chelliotis. I am the business manager of CW Local 1180, and I am chairman of the Labor Advisory Board of, of the Murphy Institute. Uh, first, uh, good afternoon to everyone, and it is my privilege to offer this testimony on behalf of the Murphy Institute uh, Advisory Board, a board on which I have served as chairman for 34 years. First, uh, let me thank the Committee on Civil Service and Labor and the Committee on Higher Education for convening this hearing. It comes at a historic moment, just as the Institute prepares to open its doors as the new CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. These two committees, led by Council Members Miller and Barron, have played a critical role in the establishment of the school. These two chairs, along with their colleagues in the City Council, have, given, uh, have been essential to getting us to this milestone in worker education. In addition the city to the City Council, I want to thank Governor Cuomo, Speaker Hastie, Senator Savino, and other members of the State Legislature. Last but certainly not least, I want to thank Chancellor Milliken, Executive Vice Chancellor Rabinowitz, Chief Operating Officer Mark Shaw, Vice Chancellor Sapienza, Secretary to the Board uh, Gail Horowitz, and especially Bill Thompson, the Chair of the CUNY Board of Trustees. And of course, uh, Greg Mancios, the Interim Dean, who has been the force behind the vision that organized labor had as to what a school of labor would look like. Uh, he has 
helped us develop and guide the plan through its various uh, modifications over time. And I'd like to personally thank uh, Greg for, for his, his efforts in that regard. And that was, that's not in the written testimony, but it's something that I needed to say. <laughs> what we have achieved to date is a consensus around a very unique and exciting vision. A vision that revolves around developing the next generation of labor and community leaders. Expanding higher education opportunities for workers seeking career advancement and serving the educational needs of labor and the broader community. The school as designed will have four units, four pillars. Labor studies, urban studies, workforce development, and an institute dedicated to research public programming, civic engagement, and leadership development. Underlying all these three stated core values are access, social justice, and diversity. This is a grand and glorious vision. The challenge now is to realize the vision. That is to build and to fortify the four pillars upon which the school will be built. The multifaceted vision with equal respect for college readiness, liberal education, intellectual development, and career readiness and social service distinguishes the new school from any other in our nation. With its emphasis on urban work, the urban workforce and leadership development, it is a school with a unique perspective, serving the interests of its constituents while helping the city and state fulfill their needs for a well-educated, highly skilled public and private workforce. As a, school, as a school for workers, union members, those from underserved communities, we are obligated to provide an array of opportunities and support services for working adults, first-time students, and transfer students. As our under, undergraduate population grows, we will need an even stronger student services component with more counselors and tutors and new programs for college readiness. These elements of the school need to be supported and monitored. From everything I have read, we are making excellent progress towards the launch of the new school in the fall of 2018. I am optimistic that the full cooperation from all the parties will meet these challenges, well armed for success, and in short, we will need resources to address our most pressing needs. We have two immediate needs. First is space, and the second is funding. The new school will be located at 25 West 43rd Street, the current home of the Murphy Institute. The strategic plan for the school calls for doubling enrollments in five years and hiring seven new faculty members, 15 new full-time staff, 18 part-time staff, the funding provided by the state and the current budgets in the current budget cycle provides the funding to hire half of these positions in the next 12 months. Yet even now, the Murphy Institute has doubled and tripled the occupancy of offices, rented classrooms from Corn the Cornell University at 34th Street, and used off-street classrooms at, at union offices. More recently, we had to close the institute's library and convert it into office space. I understand that the university is exploring the possibility of leasing two additional floors at Murphy's current location. And we are very well appreciative and cautiously optimistic for simply put, without additional space, the new school cannot grow. Secondly, we need to succeed. The school would need resources and a stable budget. We are very grateful for the increased allocation we received from the governor and the legislature this year. The allocation for our current phase two funding, however, has fallen short by nearly $800,000. We are also very grateful to the city council for its funding support of the Murphy Institute over the course of the past 17 years and for its allocation of $940,000 in the current budget year. We are requesting that the city council restore the $940,000 and increase that funding as much as possible to narrow the shortfall in our funding plan. The City Council's allocation will support the school's workforce development initiatives that are offered in collaboration with other units of the university in all five boroughs. 
There are currently more than 900 workers enrolled in these initiatives. The allocation will support a strong academic support system that ensures access and success for these students as well as the 400 students enrolled in the school's labor studies and urban studies programs. In short, this funding is needed to secure the pillars that will lift the school to a national, as a na to a national leader in the field. We have all worked so long and so hard to make this school a reality. Failure is simply not an option. So I thank you for your support in the years leading up to the establishment of the CUNY's School of Labor and Urban Studies, and I respectfully urge you to support our budget request now and in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, Mr. Chiliotis, uh, for all that you've done in uh, making the uh, Murphy School of Labor and Urban Studies a reality. Um, the previous panel, there was a question about how would you define the success of the school? And, uh, and I think that you are obviously uniquely qualified to do so, but I want to throw in a few things. Considering the, um, the school's goals and missions to create diversity and advance diversity uh, and, and their target audience, how then would you def define um, the success of the school? I take the perspective of, of my own experience in my local, where union members, my members, were told that they were not college material in their youth. And they took city jobs to move up the ranks. And we went to work sites and told them that they are college material, that they can succeed, that they can enroll in school and get the degrees that they need to advance their careers. It is my hope that what the Murphy Institute, what the, what the school is able to achieve is to open the doors of the university to working adults who in the past thought, college is not for me. I'm not ready to go to college. I can't succeed. And to show them that they can succeed by offering their co-workers who have succeeded examples of how they did. And we have done that in the work that we did with the UFT on on having paraprofessionals become teachers, on the work that we're doing with the operating engineers, where they're becoming building managers after taking courses at New York Technical College. These are all programs that Murphy helped put together that are part of the bigger picture of what the workforce in this city needs in the ever-changing work environment. And as a trade unionist, my goal is to make sure that my members have work and to be relevant to the workplace by having the skills that they need to remain employable. And that we, the only way we can achieve that is by offering the education that they need to keep them current as to the changing world of work. And so for me, success is having those workers get that education, be prepared to provide the services that are necessary in their various fields, both in the public and private sector. And I, that will look require the expansion of the program. It will require us reaching out to unions and showing them how the university has programs that can help their members advance their careers. So with, with that being said, Arthur, um, how, then do, do, how then can your students support the needs and the values of the communities that they're serving in terms of public policy? And um, obviously, that is a, a big goal here to be able to advance social justice issues around diversity and others. How then, specifically, are these students uh, supporting the needs of, and the values of the communities that they reside in? One of the initial goals of the Murphy Institute was to empower our members, to empower the students to understand that they need to be in involved in the electoral process, in interacting with government officials, in being participants in their communities, in the community organizations, in being active in the union. All are elements of being a citizen of this city. And that one of the components of our, of our uh, educational programs are to 
have our members understand their role as citizens in participating in our political process. And certainly with regard to workers in the public service, getting the academic credentials they need to advance their careers, to better serve the public, to ensure that the services that they deliver to the public are of the highest quality, and they do so in an effective and efficient manner. That also secures their job, but more importantly, provides the vital sub public services that this city does to so many of our citizens in the many roles that all public workers play in delivering those services. I know in the past that uh, Murphy had provided research uh, study and information. Oh, yes, we did, yes. On, yeah, on, on a number of subject matters related to communities of color and, and so forth. What roles will Murphy continue to play, if any, as a school of uh, uh, urban studies? Well, as one of the pillars is, is the research uh, uh, in areas that, uh, quite frankly, if, 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 the, uh, if, the, if it comes from a labor union or, 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 uh, or the community, that we could look into and, and, and pursue. I think what we have is, is excellent faculty who do this kind of research who can engage in that. And we have our annual report that comes out uh, indicating what uh, labor participation in the city and the state and so on. And so uh, we've been you know, doing that all along. We hold forums on a regular basis that raise issues of concern uh, to the labor movement, to working people. And uh, there's a whole program that, that the Murphy Institute puts out. We have our, our Friday morning uh, sessions where people are invited to attend and speakers are, 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 are brought together to discuss pub public policy issues. Good, and, and, and I just want to say that I know we have partnered in the past yes. on, on such studies, but I, I know that now we have uh, uh, um, members of the, uh, four members of the uh, Black, Latino, and Asian Caucus here Mm -hmm. uh, that is something that, as we move forward, that um, we hope to further engage in and, and hopefully oh, absolutely. Yes. be able to uh, access some of the, the resources of Murphy Institute because of that partnership. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we look forward to. So hopefully um, we'll be able to do that. Uh, I understand that Council Member Cumbo has a question, mm -hmm. and I'm going to pass it along to her. You weren't going to get off that easy. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here, and it's so great to see you at City Hall for a third day. <laughs> I've never seen someone retire and work so hard at the same time. <laughs> so I wanted to ask a question that, uh, particularly for communities of color, um, for people that want to run for office, that want to understand how campaigns are built, want to understand, um, you know, so many of the elected officials that are here come from the labor movement. Sure. And so is this an opportunity in many ways through the Institute to be able to create a pathway and an educational opportunity for communities of color to learn how to become politically engaged in terms of not just understanding civic engagement, but also the real nuts and bolts in the infrastructure of how to run a campaign because labor unions certainly play a major role in the political process, but many of the organizations that are currently in existence are often not open or um, accepting or engaging of candidates of color in order to actually run. So what we find are many candidates of color while we encourage people to run and there's all this opportunity to run, um, most people don't have the nuts and bolts and the understanding of how to actually have that happen. Mm -hmm. So the ability to be able to come from the labor movement coupled with the opportunity of having the education on how to actually run a campaign and what that means, is that something that's part of the Institute's role or could it be? In fact, we've offered courses on how to do that. Uh, and, and, and we have had forums uh, where, where civic participation takes the next step and talks about, well, what are you doing to get involved in, in, in running for office, in, in influencing the decision of, of office holders, and so on. So, so uh, we have had seminars in that regard. Uh, uh, some of my members are nodding their heads because they've attended those seminars. Mm. And, and in fact, 
uh, I can speak again for my local, an outgrowth of doing that is we have established community councils in every, in every borough of the city where our members interact with their elected uh, officials in the community, I addressing see. not the labor needs, but the schools mm -hmm. and policing and the streets and those issues of being a citizen who is engaged in government and to see that government responds to their needs. So we have, we have been part of, of, of engaged in, 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 that, in that process. The, the, the Murphy Institute does offer experts in this field who can put together those courses and have put together those courses. So maybe part of our problem is broadcasting it more widely. Uh, but I think, I think, I think we, could, we could do a better job in that regard uh, because uh, we have been able to uh, certainly, it, start, uh, it started with a number of unions, but it has expanded to, I, I don't, Greg, what, what was the last number of people we had? There was a big conference that we did on this. Could you could, could you come to the mic? I apologize. We, we're going to need him anyway. He's so. <laughs> already sworn in, so. Uh, Murphy offers a 10-week program every spring and every fall, uh, specifically to prepare people to run for office. Oh, that's phenomenal. We do it uh, twice a year. One is done in uh, collaboration with the Latino Institute, and the other one is offered by us exclusively. But both focus on preparing people to run for office. We have 60 students currently enrolled in a program, and we have 80 people on a waiting list. Please yeah. feel free uh, to utilize myself, and I know sure. many other members would yeah. love to be um, sources of, yeah. of research or experience uh, and to share our experiences yeah. and what we've learned. Uh, I know particularly with um, many of the women electeds, there's the push for 21 in 2021, mm -hmm. and anything that we can do to see that as a connection uh, where individuals are being trained and motivated and inspired would be so phenomenal. But to piggyback on that as well, this institute is so revolutionary mm -hmm. and one of a kind in, in that, what kind of textbooks or reading materials or how do you find the course materials to be able to teach the very work that you're doing? And do you find that in many ways that the institute almost has to create its own material in order to teach the course because there's not a lot of scholarship mm -hmm. um, on much of this. Well, you know, the, the um, material for the readings, the reading materials are always selected by the faculty. But what's interesting about Murphy is we have some of the most prominent labor scholars in the country with us. We have, I think I mentioned the, the, the 13 faculty members of those 13, Amongst those 13 faculty members, they have published a total of 70 uh, books. Oh, that's wonderful. 70 books from, that, from those 13 faculty. That's really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the material that comes, comes out right in the field from of your labor professors. studies, it comes right out of our, so the, the, this material, their material is being used throughout the country. We do also develop our own curriculum. We've published um, booklets. We've uh, put together anthologies. So that is part of who we are and what we do, and we plan to do much more of that. In terms of the research, the question was asked about uh, will we be engaged in resource. Part of the budget before the state uh, provides for $300,000 uh, allocated specifically for uh, research on policy related to labor and urban communities. That's phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Just one question. As we've been talking and you've given your testimony, you continually say Murphy Institute, Murphy Institute, Murphy Institute, okay, because yeah. that's what it is. But we know that we're now going to be moving to the CUNY School of Law, of Labor and Ed oh. Urban Studies. What will happen to the name Murphy? Will you continue to use that? Will it be perhaps attached to the institute that you talk about in your testimony? You say the school, 
as designed, will have four units, four pillars, if you will. Mm -hmm. Labor studies, urban studies, workforce development, and an institute dedicated to research, public programming, civic, engage civic engagement, and leadership development. So are we going to continue to say Murphy as we talk about the school, or how will that name be carried forth? Is there a plan for that? We do know that he was a former chancellor and son of a, a great activist. So mm -hmm. do you have any plans? Is that any way included? Uh, uh, personally, I, and I think a number of the advisory board who, who remember Joe Murphy and, and the, the work that he did, uh, and I personally, in terms of his suggestion that we start labor programs in the university, I would like to see that name continued. Uh, I, and uh, I think the institute, the fourth pillar w uh, of research, w would be an excellent place to do that. Uh, the advisory board will have to vote on that, and whatever the consensus of the advisory board is, that'll be what we will we will do. Uh, so, okay. actually, uh, it's a very good question, and we uh, uh, are we're fortunate in that it. We currently are the Murphy Institute for Worker Education and Labor Studies. And so um, one plan would be to simply call us the uh, CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and the Murphy Institute for Worker Education. Since Labor Studies is already in the name of the school, we just lop off the, the name in Murphy Institute and we don't even have to go before the Board of Trustees to make that kind of change. And I, you know what I'd like to propose to the what I plan to propose to the labor advise to the labor and community advisory board in June is that our letterhead read the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies and the Murphy Institute of Worker Education. Thank you. Um, currently, um, the Queens College campus mm -hmm. and those students there from the uh, education. Institute, w will they be automatically incorporated into the new school and will still be conducting uh, classes at that location? Uh, absolutely. They will be part of the Murphy Institute, if that's the name we agree on. But uh, that will be part of that, that pillar that uh, is dedicated to workforce development and worker education. And that pillar, all those students are uh, uh, provided with educational opportunities in collaboration with other units. So Queens College is our biggest program, but we also have over 100 students at Brooklyn, over 100 students at Lehman, and over 100 students at the College of Staten Island. That's great. And, and one of my personal uh, pet peeves as a former business agent mm -hmm. as well is the, um, the, the union semester internship program. Yeah. Are we expanding that? Uh, what, what will that look like as we move forward and uh, integrate it into the new school? So I'm happy to report that in addition to Union Semester, we have uh, launched uh, a Community Semester program as well uh, uh, so that uh, community organizations can uh, take on interns. Uh, my colleague Rochelle Pindakoffi here was instrumental in doing that. We uh, that was a challenge because unions typically have the resources to be able to hire uh, an intern. The monies that are provided by the unions go directly to the students. Um, uh, though that covers a stipend. They work 30, I think it's 32 hours a week, and then take classes in the evening with us. Um, that model now is expen extended to community organizations and those uh, those students in community semester are funded by foundations. We've raised external funds from foundations to support community organizations because we know that very often they don't have those kinds of resources that unions do to hire uh, students. So we have our first class this year. That is excellent. Okay, thank you so very much. It, it's been uh, really good. Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, there were some questions asked before regarding the diversity scholarships, and uh, the challenge grant re uh, has in it uh, a challenge to the labor movement to raise funds to equal the $100,000 every year, and we've achieved it every year. That means labor organizations have put in the money 
to match the $100,000 the university does. That's the commitment of the labor movement to this program in terms of diversity within the labor movement. And the second thing is that much of the tuition that is accounted for in the budget comes out of union tuition programs that have been established by those unions to support their members as they go back to school. So, uh, and it's important to, to, uh, to note that because uh, otherwise our members would, could not afford even, even the city university tuition. Thank, Thank you very I'm glad much. you added that point Thank because you. I thought that that was the case, but yeah, yeah. you have the opportunity to put on the record so that we know. Thank Great. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll have our next panel. And we're calling Ms. Gloria Middleton to come forward and Melanie Willingham Joggers or Jagers from the Worker Institute at Cornell University. Please come forward. Thank you. So this panel will be speaking on the Rezo, and then we'll have one final panelist to come and speak back on Murphy Institute. So if you would give us your name and your testimony. Press that button. Good afternoon, all, and thank you for this opportunity. Um, good afternoon, members of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor, and Chairman Danique Miller. My name is Gloria Middleton. I am the president of Communication Workers of America, Local 1180. We represent 8,600 active and 6,200 retired New York City workers who have dedicated their lives to making sure that the city of New York is one of the most efficient and best run cities in the country. My, my members work in dozens of New York City mayoral agencies, h, &H the Board of Education, the Housing Authority, the Transit Authority, the School Construction Authority, and the state's unified court system. Local 1180 also represents workers at private companies such as the Jacob Javits Convention Center and at not-for-profit organizations including Planned Parenthood of New York City, the SPCA, Human Rights First, and Human Rights Watch. As administrator and supervisory workers, my members process payroll, manage computer systems, monitor contracts, pay vendors, supervise frontline staff, and in general, coordinate a whole host of things that most people don't even realize. We are the hidden human infrastructure that makes the city of New York work. As you know, the attacks on labor have been a long-standing problem in this country with high-powered corporations and leaders, as well as well-financed right-wingers like the Koch brothers, and unfortunately, even many politicians doing everything in their power to undermine our strength. The Janus versus AFSCME Supreme Court case is not the first legal attempt to dismantle unions, and I'm positive it won't be the last. New York State and New York City are known as the most progressive state and city in America. Governor Cuomo has already shown his commitment to organized labor by signing legislation that gives unions a fighting chance to exist and continue to work. We do, we, the work we do for our members after the Janus decision comes down, it is not going to be an easy time for labor. If and most likely when the Supreme Court rules in favor of the plaintiff Janus, the new le state legislation will allow unions to continue representing members and providing the much needed services and benefits our members have come to expect and definitely deserve. The Janus case is about nothing more than stripping workers of their rights for representation and stripping unions of their rights to exist. It is not about First Amendment rights. While many will claim it's about creating right to work states, we all know what right to work simply means the right to work for less. It is a strategy designed to keep the playing field uneven, mostly for women and minorities, which compromise the majority of CWA Local 11A. The history of right to work is long and intense. If you're not aware of it, 
I'm going to send you to Google. <laughs> I am hopeful that the city council will show its support of the labor movement in the face of the Janus decision by passing a resolution reinforcing your commitment to the hundreds of unions that represent workers in this great city. By working together, we can continue to enhance the greatest city in America. Thank you for affording me the opportunity to address the New York City Council Committee on the Civil Service and Labor. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the, uh, members of the committees on higher education uh, and civil service and labor. My name is Melanie Willingham Jaggers. I'm the Program Associate Director of the Worker Institute at Cornell University's School of Industrial and Labor Relations. I'm here today to testify on behalf of the Worker Institute. The Worker Institute does research, policy, development, and technical assistance, and education and training to improve the lives of working people and to contribute to a more just, equitable, and sustainable workplace and society. We believe that creating an economy and society that works for workers, where their dignity is honored, their voices are heard, and their labor is rewarded, largely depends on strong workers' rights, collective representation in the workplace, and building a diverse and inclusive labor movement. We want to thank you for the opportunity to speak uh, today on the resolution uh, 190 and 240 and the formation of the CUNY School of Labor and Urban Studies. We'd like to make four main points that speak to why unions and public sector collective bargaining are critically important to building a more just, equitable, sustainable workplace and society. First, the problem of growing inequality. Inequality of income, wealth, power, hope, and opportunity is one of the greatest challenges to our city and our nation. When unionization rates have been at their highest levels, we have enjoyed the most equitable distribution of wealth and power. Without strong unions, inequality inevitably increases. Today, less than 7% of private sector workers are unionized, while 34% of public sector workers are unionized. One of the last bastions of strong unionization is the public sector at the local, state, and federal levels, in which there are 7.2 million unionized workers in the United States. In New York City and New York State, the public sector is particularly strong. About 70% of public sector workers are unionized. That's double the national level. Not surprisingly, the right wing is targeting public sector unions with heightened animus. Second, the attack on the public sector is a great threat to our democracy. The Janus case is fundamentally about the kind of society and economy we seek to build in the coming decades. One that serves the interests of the 1% or one that serves the needs of the overwhelming majority of us. The attack on unions are part of a menacing assault on the traditions and institutions of democracy itself. We believe that democracy can withstand this challenge only if workers are organized, have a voice, and can fight uh, for more equitable distribution of power and wealth. As Louis Brandeis famously said, we can have democracy or we can have wealth concentrated in the hands of the few, but we cannot have both. The organizations behind the Janus Supreme Court cases, case includes the American Legislative Exchange Council, the State Policy Network, and other conservative think tanks funded by the Koch brothers, the Walton Foundation, and others. And they have been clear about what their goal is. We are here, they are determined uh, to destroy uh, unions and to stop the biggest obstacle they face to concentrating wealth, privatizing public services and schools, and deregulating worker and environmental protections. Third, Public sector collective bargaining has been extremely important to advancing the needs and interests of women and people of color. When the National Labor Relations Act was passed in 1935, many women and workers of color were employed in economic sectors excluded by the legislation, agriculture, domestic work, healthcare, and the public sector. The rise of public sector unionism in the 1960s and beyond was driven by the energy of the civil rights and women's movements and brought the benefits of collective bargaining to that sector, transforming the lives of millions. It is sadly ironic and relevant that the Janus case is happening, happening around the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. in Memphis, Tennessee, where he was supporting the striking sanitation workers and working to link the struggles of economic and racial justice and the labor and civil rights movements. The struggle to coalesce the women's movement, the racial justice movement, and the labor movement continues unabated, and the right wing's attempt to undermine the public sector is also clearly part of an attempt to undermine the progress of women and people of color. Finally, the public sector union, sorry, finally, public sector unions are integral in establishing high quality public services, including education, healthcare, first responder, emergency services, 
electricity, transportation, and more. Public sector unions ensure that workers are adequately trained and compensated, provide vitally important whistleblower protections, job flexibility, career advancement, and career advancement opportunities. We must protect our public sector unions if we want to protect our high quality public services. This is borne out in practice. In Wisconsin, public sector bargaining was recently restricted and agency fees were eliminated. As a result, the average annual salary and benefits of teachers dropped by $10,843, it's 12.6%. This has led to high teacher turnover, a major shortage of teachers, and poor outcomes for students. This is one example among many and should remind us that good jobs um, uh, with collective bargaining uh, create good outcomes for workers, communities, and our society as a whole. In conclusion, uh, public sector unions reduce inequality, increase democracy, advance the interests of working people, especially women and people of color, and ensure high quality governmental services. We encourage uh, everyone in the city council to use the powers at their disposal to protect workers' rights, to collectively bargain, and to continue to move our society toward greater justice and equity for all. Thank you for your leadership on this issue. Finally, as a land grant school, with a public service mission to improve the lives of working people in New York State and beyond, the Worker Institute is very encouraged and supportive of CUNY's establishment of the School for Labor and Urban Studies. The Worker Institute has enjoyed a collaborative partnership with CUNY's Murphy Institute for many years, undertaking a variety of, uh, of joint programs and events to help, that bu help build uh, both institutions and provide tremendous benefit to working people in New York City and the broader region. As we said at the beginning of our testimony, the crisis of inequality uh, is one of the greatest challenges of our time, and we welcome another institution and partner in New York City that is dedicated to the advancement of workers' rights and collective representation and the creation of a more just society. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you so very much, Representative. It's my alma mater here. So, um, I want to thank you both. I think, is there any questions? Um, I think that we've, uh, the, the, your testimonies have been very consistent with some of the things that we talked about with Murphy and its needs uh, to move forward as a school of labor and, and urban studies. Uh, in particular, as uh, your testimony, each of your testimonies talked about the Janus decision and its direct correlation on women and communities of color. And that impact is certainly for those reasons that we, I and my colleagues have, have uh, um, put forth this resolution um, to the federal government and uh, because of the impact that will have on communities like uh, that we represent. Uh, my community ha happens to be the most densely populated union district in the city of New York mm -hmm. and the most densely populated state in New York I mean, in the country, so that just about makes us the most densely populated union community in the country. Um, there is no doubt that there's a direct correlation in that, in the fact that we have the highest African American home ownership. Mm -hmm. So it's about wealth building, it is about next generation, it is about opportunity that we have to protect here. And so I, I, I applaud the work that you um, sisters are doing, that you're doing over at Cornell, and that certainly what Murphy has been doing, what it will continue to do. And um, it has been just great for the council and me personally to, to be partnered um, with these institutions. And I, I just want to say on behalf of, of, of the Committee on Civil Service and Labor that we look forward to this continued partnership. And if I could speak on behalf of the members of, of the council, that it has been very fruitful. It's been an opportunity for, for look, this I remember two years ago we had a, a labor 101 for some, actually it's more than that, for some incoming members who did not necessarily understand the values mm -hmm. of this movement and how it impacted the communities that we serve. Mm -hmm. And while we still have that conversation, I, I think that we've gotten far beyond um, where we were a few years back. So and, and it's because of the work, uh, the continuous work and advocacy that are being done by these institutions. So I just want to thank you for that. And um, before, and, and, and so uh, before I, I forget um, and we conclude, I want to thank um, certainly my counsel, uh, Malcolm Boothom, and uh, Kevin 
Kowalski, our policy analyst, Kendall was back there somewhere and snuck out. And certainly my senior policy guy, Joseph Goldblum, and uh, Brandon Clark for the work that they put together, uh, the work that they've done to put this uh, hearing together. So I'm very thankful. And certainly I'd like to thank my colleague, esteemed colleague, uh, Councilmember Barron, um, for agreeing to jointly uh, hold the hearing. It was very, very important. And I am so glad that we can see we just love it when a plan comes together. So, Greg and Arthur, thank you so much for the plan, and, it, and it's coming along. Thank you, Nancy. And we thank you, thank you very much for this committee and what they have done for the Murphy Institute. Thank you. I'm going. All right, I just certainly want to have my comments of commendation on the record. We applaud you for the work that you do, and we certainly acknowledge that, yes, unions are under attack, and we've got to make sure that we stand strong and fight and push back and make sure the workers understand that if this decision comes down, that we've got to make sure that they are motivated and self-activated to make sure that they keep their union strong. But thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. And we have our final panelist coming forward, uh, Zoltan Bolsa, who's representing himself. And at this point, he can come forward. Thank you. And you can just give us your name and your testimony. Certainly. Um, thank you for your time this afternoon. My name is Zoltan Boka. I am a former CUNY student, and upon hearing that this committee is considering CUNY's budget and their new chancellor hire, um, I thought I would share my experiences in this realm. Um, I am disabled due to a childhood brain injury. Nevertheless, I was accepted at CUNY's Graduate Center and for a PhD program twice, once on a probationary basis and after earning A grades permanently. It was known at all times that I would need accommodations to succeed, something CUNY re readily agreed to provide. Oh, okay. <coughs> okay. Um, unfortunately, the assurances were a cruel sham designed entirely to extract tuition payments. After five years, matters came to a head and the ADA coordinator, an attorney who had no medical, psychological, or disability background named Sharon Lerner, demanded a new medical evaluation. I provided this at my own expense, and when she received it, she failed to implement it and chose instead to attempt to bully me out of the program by, for example, asking if I had ever published anything, and when I said yes, she observed, and I quote, there's a lot of crap out there. Hence, I contacted then Chancellor Goldstein and asked that he, had act, he act expeditiously. He chose not to act at all. And when pressing the matter by presenting my medical records to my department chair, who is alleged to be a neuropsychologist, I was expelled in the space of less than an hour. <clears throat> this is not to say, however, that CUNY has forgotten about my plight under its current leadership. Subsequent to my expulsion, they sold an outstanding tuition payment to debt collector. CUNY is legendary for its faultlessness and its avarice. It is a running joke among its students who display this poster <coughs> where they refer to CUNY as an education factory. And through a FOIL request, I learned that CUNY itself sees its students the same way. My doctorate mentor at one point advised that although my work was poor, they took me in because, and I quote her directly, our numbers were low. I was nothing to them, and I am not alone. Students are routinely stalled in their progress as CUNY attempts to vacuum up every last dime. In 2012, according to CUNY's own figures, which can be accessed on its website, only one in four students completed a bachelor's or associate's degree within four years. It gets worse in the graduate realm, and I have known many students who spent 20 years, that's 20, two zero, trying to earn a doctorate at CUNY. And what of CUNY's administration? Their ranks expand by the day. Matthew uh, Schoengood, who was the Vice President of Student Affairs, responded to my FOIL request by attempting to shake me down for a 25 cent per page copying fee. When CUNY's behavior began attracting media inquiries, his successor, Lynette Phillips, did the same thing, only this time she said that she would sell copies of junk emails for a quarter a page. 
There is no sum too piddling and no conduct too reprehensible to attempt to use as a vehicle for extraction. One consequence of this attitude is that Matthew Goldstein, the CUNY chancellor whom I backed for years to fulfill CUNY's obligations, pleased that he turned a deaf ear to, feels comfortable with raising money for and advertising a scholarship program for disabled students. His pitch to donors can be seen on CUNY's website and it describes him as, and I quote, a devotee of access and opportunity for CUNY students with disabilities, unless of course they approach him directly. Goldstein's hustle, which comes on top of his half a million dollar payout when he left his position, is an indecent act that demonstrates that the bottom does not exist. These ethos trickle down to individual faculty who feel comfortable with spending years enriching themselves by pretending to mentor students whom they secretly hold in contempt. That's fine for the factory or the slaughterhouse, but not for the schoolhouse. Intervention and oversight needs to begin today. Thank you. Uh, we want to thank you for your testimony. It's not the topic of the hearing today. I understand. And uh, the documents that you have supplied to us do indicate that you can appeal uh, the determination if you disagree right. with it. So we would encourage you to follow that path. Thank you. Thank you so much. Seeing that there are no further individuals coming to provide testimony on today's topic, this hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. Chicken soup. Oh.